um, morning or afternoon or evening or whatever it is, wherever you are. <laughs> um, welcome back to day two of our um, communities workshop. I don't know about you, but I really enjoyed yesterday's workshop. So I'm really looking forward to a good morning this morning. Um, just quick, very quick run through the same slides as yesterday. So just to point out our code of conduct, um, the web page is there. Um, and that's what we'll stick to, if that's okay with everyone. Um, and just a quick look at, as I said yesterday, we're nearly at the end of the source um, events. So we just got our source finale on the 24th of March. So um, please sign up for that. Hopefully we'll have a, a good, good meeting. There's gonna be a talk, have a review of how the events have gone and then hopefully some time for, for some networking as well. And just to say that we, we are recording this event um, so if you don't want to be on the recording, please just mute, mute your um, microphone and, and turn your video off and then you won't, won't be on. You can ask questions in the chat. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to the team for fantastic day two. Great. OK, so I will add, add my welcome to, uh, to that of Louise and uh, just say mm -hmm. Welcome back to, to day two of our Building Research Software Communities workshop. Um, for any of you who weren't here yesterday, I think we might have one or two people who weren't uh, who weren't able to join us for the first part. So just a quick run through and reminder from, from yesterday. Um, so I'm Jeremy Cohen from Imperial College London and uh, um, my co-organizers of the workshop are Michelle Barker from the Research Software Alliance and Daniel Neust from the University of Munster. You can find full details of the workshop uh, on the the URL that's at the bottom of that slide, um, along with uh, the agenda, which I will run through um, for today anyway in a moment. Just to quickly recap on yesterday, um, we, we had four excellent lightning talks to kick us off to get some idea of the challenges faced with uh, both new and existing communities and some really nice stories about the achievements. Then we had a, an excellent collaborative session led by Daniel. Um, which was a great way to kind of hear about some of the challenges that, that you faced um, yourselves within your, your kind of work as part of either building and running communities or just being members of communities. And then a really, really interesting session, which I know um, people really enjoyed from, from Lou about the community participation approaches. Daniel's done a great job in, in taking all of the feedback that you provided from the session and kind of summarizing all that. And I believe these are actually the, uh, the emojis that people assigned during the the session so um you can see some 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 great uh, approaches there to to kind of highlighting the challenges so just to, very quickly to to point out that that these are kind of some of the things that i think we're going to hear a lot more about again today so you know a lot of common challenges that people have faced um in terms of their their either work building communities or participating in communities and you know really this can be summarized into these four areas so you know there's real challenges in in finding people who want to engage with these communities even though we, we kind of know they're out there so you know anecdotally we see a lot of a lot of interest from RSEs in being part of communities and getting involved but it's often difficult to, to find the RSEs who are sort of embedded in um, in research groups and whatever around institutions there's there's a lot of um, interesting issues around organization and communication and how you how you manage that and also in in ensuring that we can maintain ongoing engagement and the expectations that we have of both our community organizers but also the participants of the communities and you know really to kind of tie all that together i think these issues around in incentives and recognition and how do we actually find the resources to keep these communities going so some really interesting points there and if you go to the the collaborative notes document from yesterday which i will highlight the link to in a second uh, you can find daniel's full summary from the session um, with all of the kind of comments and points there this is just a sort of condensed version so do go and take a look at that. Um, some really, really great points there. So just to to now give you a quick overview of today's agenda. So we've had our, our intros. In a minute, I will be handing over to, to Lou Woodley from CSCCE, who's going to um, run a session on community champions. Um, and then after the break, we will have a session on community sustainability from Toby Hodges and Sarah Rono from the Carpentries. Um, so I think two, two, two really interesting sessions there where we'll be able to, to kind of learn a lot more about community uh, sustainability and how to kind of champion and maintain communities. Quick reminder about the notes document. So we're, we're running a second collaborative notes document for today. There's the URL to that. 
uh, the two documents are cross-linked, so you can get back and forth between day one and day two from the links at the top of the documents. Um, so if you want to go back and look at uh, Daniel's summary from, from his session or any of the other notes from the sessions yesterday, you can get back to the day one document through the, the links there. And just finally, before I hand over to Lou to highlight that there's lots of ways to get involved beyond the, the workshop, we will highlight these again at the at the end, but do do take a look at some of these different opportunities to engage with the, with the communities that are both involved with this workshop, but also some of the wider communities in the space. Okay, so welcome back everybody. Um, and really, really pleased to welcome uh, Sarah Rono and Toby Hodges from the Carpentries who are going to run our next session on community sustainability. So I will uh, hand over to Toby and Sarah. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, and thanks for doing a great job organizing and running this. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm Toby Hodges. I am the curriculum community developer uh, with the Carpentries. Um, that means I work with members of our community who are developing lessons to support that lesson development and lesson design. Um, and I'm looking forward to running this session with you all uh, and with Sarah uh, about community sustainability. Uh, Sarah, would you like to introduce yourself briefly? Thanks, Toby, and hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Njambirono. I am Director of Community at the Carpentries. Um, I'm based in Tallinn, Estonia, and I'm very excited to be speaking with you um, about community sustainability today. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so in the break, uh, we copied and pasted a bunch of new sort of agenda material um, at the bottom of the, um, the shared document that hopefully you're all already connected to. Please post into the Zoom chat if you need a link to the, um, to the notes doc again. Uh, and to get us in the, in the mood for this session, um, I've, I'm gonna ask you all to, just for a few minutes, uh, think about communities that you're aware of, that you admire and, um, and why you admire those communities. Um, and after that, we'll go on to discuss a bit more about community sustainability and what it means um, and your experiences with sustainable communities and, and uh, going on from there to talk a bit about things that you can do to, uh, to try to ensure that your community uh, effort is sustainable. So yeah, uh, please take a few minutes now to write your thoughts into the doc about which communities you admire and why. Thanks. I can already see from the responses that have gone in so far that the UK uh, research software engineers community has a lot of uh, admirers in the group. That's good to know. And few people mentioning things about welcoming newcomers and supporting um, supporting continuity um, and supporting growth, uh, being friendly. I also think that that's very important. Um, I'm going to give you thirty seconds more to write in before I hand over to Sarah, um, but please. If you haven't finished in that time, um, please feel free to keep typing. Uh, it'll be really good to be able to refer back to these notes that you're putting in as you go along. And so, yeah, it's nice to see quite a lot of you identifying aspects of sustainable community efforts, looking at, um, as mentions of long-term visions and uh, establishment of, of leadership programs and structures and things like that. Uh, we're going to mention a bit more later in the, uh, in the session. So, Sarah, mm -hmm. would you like to take us through the first um, or the next question, I guess, and the discussion around that. Absolutely. Um, so thank you everyone for sharing um, about the communities you admire and why briefly. Um, we will have more time 
in this hour to talk about uh, the more specific things you admire and where they fall um, in the different categories that Lou began to talk about um, and that we'll also share with you. Um, so one of the things I think is really important for us to do as we start out um, is to talk about what community sustainability means to you, how you define the term, um, particularly in the context of building the communities that you're interfacing with. Um, and so uh, please take a few minutes in the doc to share uh, what this term means to you. It means a whole lot of different things to different people, depending on the domains of expertise you work in um, and the fields you're looking at. So I, I think it's important for us to have a shared understanding. So I'd want for you to share what you think it means. Um, and then we'll share what Toby and I have in mind and what working definition we are looking at for this session. Um, yeah, so take two or three minutes to share what community sustainability means to you. I really like um, the mention of existing processes, a vision that's clear to everyone, a, um, a set of values that are shared by everyone in the community. Um, I like the last point about new members coming in and other people are leaving the community without it shaking um, the foundations of the community. Passing knowledge to new members, that's very good. Love that. Um, so some sort of peer mentoring processes going on in a community. Keeping people active over time. Canova seems to be um, a big um, a big item of discussion here, so we'll definitely make sure to focus on that. So community ownership is also a big um, topic that's coming up here. Um, not one person, um, like community growth is not attributed to one person or existence is not attributed to any one person. the community can grow and change um, and adapt to changing circumstances while keeping it so. Mm -hmm. Finding ways to keep people active through and through. Right, so I really great. Um, onboarding and outboarding. <laughs> this is one of Toby's favorite topics, so you'll definitely hear about it at some point today. This is really great. Thank you for sharing. Um, all right, so I'm going to share with you what Toby and I um, came up with as a working definition for our session. Um, it's, it's definitely not, you know, written in stone and can be expanded, um, and we welcome your thoughts around this. Um, so for this session, we are defining community sustainability as the ability um, for any given community, whether it meets online or in person, um, to continue serving value to um, its incoming and existing members uh, over time. So um, I think because there's many ways to approach the question of sustainability um, for new communities that are just being set up. These are a really good set of questions to help you define what will constitute sustainability, what will keep your community going over time um, and growing um, over the years. And even for existing communities, this set of questions serve as a really good basis to um, audit your processes and to see whether what you're doing is contributing to the sustainability of your community or its detriment. Um, so do you have a clear set of goals, which is something some, someone said, a few people said, so goals, vision, um, values, are those uh, articulated clearly? Um, do you have a strategy that is flexible enough to adapt to the evolving needs of your community? 
Um, do you have set ways to bring in new community members and make sure they have pathways to start to be involved in your community? Um, I think this is one of the more important things that is sometimes overlooked. And so um, particularly for mature communities, you might end up in a situation where you have this really engaged community of people who've been there for so many years, um, but anyone trying to come in has sort of such a steep learning curve and they end up giving up in the process. And so when people drop off, they sort of just a reducing number of active community members without opportunity for others to take on activities. So um, consider your new members and design your community activities for them. And how do you keep existing members engaged over time, right? Um, are they doing the same thing that they were doing six years ago when they joined your community? Have they been able to do more? Do they find their voice? Are they heard in more ways? Um, you know, and I, I like what people said about your activities not being dependent on any one person. So when people think about um, your community, do they think about Toby as a person or do they think about, you know, this whole group of people that they cannot begin to name and exhaust in a list, right? Because that's important. Um, so it should be bigger than any one person the different facets of your community should definitely be speaking to each other um, and be dependent to each other so that there's co-ownership of that process. And um, one of the things that I really like that Toby mentioned when we were preparing this is that it's really important to um, define equity at the very beginning and to think about how your processes will be um, equitable across the board. Um, and one of the things we'll talk about is the, the role of accessibility and how important it is in ensuring, you know, that equity is upheld across your community interactions. And then, you know, um, we've talked about values and vision and goals, but because people are likely to have different um, viewpoints, um, it's also important to design processes that, you know, um, speak to conflict resolution at any point that that arises because that is likely to come up and to design um, your community norms, your code of conduct to, to protect people, to make them feel safe, but also guided in the ways that they should contribute to your community. Right, so um, these are really good questions for you to keep in mind um, and to carry with you wherever you go. And even for the rest of the questions we have in this section, um, keep these questions in mind. Um, Toby? Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Exactly keeping those questions in mind and what um, what you've already written into the, uh, the section above um, and the things that Sarah just talked about now, what I want to ask you to think about next is a community that you're a part of or um, or perhaps a community that you used to be a part of if you're not anymore. Um, think about what it was that brought you into that community in the first place. But also the second related question is think about what it is that keeps you there or that kept you there if you're thinking of a community that you were a member of in the past. Um, and start writing your thoughts into there and then uh, in a few minutes I will uh, take some time to sum up. So already, I think a couple of trends emerging from the answers to what it was that brought you into the community in the first place. Um, it's quite common for people to say that they found a community that um, that they knew they had a lot of shared goals or um, kind of shared interests um, with the, um, the kind of stated um, scope of the community and others um, talking about situations where some particular event or interaction resulted in them first engaging or finding out about that community. Um, to use myself as an example for a moment, this was the case for me with the with the Carpentries years ago. Um, I first got involved with that community 
because someone invited me to teach a at a software carpentry workshop um and because i agreed to do so i thought it was a good idea to apply to become a instructor as well and then um that's it that kind of led to the first engagement um i will follow up that half an anecdote um after i've had a chance to look at your answers um for what it is that keeps you there and so looking at these responses to what it is that keeps you there people talking about a sense of belonging and also a feeling that they are benefiting from involvement um and so this is the flip side i think to the um the thing that gets people first involved uh, might be some sort of like value that is offered um for for initially engaging but then i think what's reflected in these second answers is that that needs to be sort of followed through on as well and if the the community continues to offer value to the members beyond that initial interaction then uh, that can really help to sustain that kind of engagement um yeah it looks like my web browser has completely given up the ghost on on following up those updates to the to the document so sarah could you scroll down a little bit so that i can see if there are other responses below um and yeah someone talking about um peer support which is really good to hear like the opportunity to connect with other people who are interested in similar things and who can provide advice um or or feedback um and recognition within the field for being part of the community that's a really important one as well um thank you for that so i will try to copy and paste something into this document and we'll see how it goes um but perhaps um sarah you could put the slides back up um oh it worked great um so one resource and sort of framework i guess that i found really um uh really valuable when thinking about this kind of sustained um engagement with the community uh is this model um from the mozilla um open leaders framework um of the mountain of engagement which talks about people coming in at sort of the bottom of the mountain um as their first contact with the community and then um or, or with the project um in some cases you talk about this in terms of a project as well um and then needing to find ways to sort of facilitate their climbing of that mountain to get more and more involved and to participate more and more um, in the activities of the community and and even then reaching towards the the higher levels of the mountain um, to take on leadership roles within that community as well and so uh, that framework provides some some questions to think about um, uh as a community leader or a community manager uh to help people sort of engage with the community and to um and to yeah facilitate that process of getting more and more involved uh, so you should think about how it is that a um that a potential member will first hear about your community and what that first impression that they will get is um about what your community is about and what your, your values are um how are they first going to engage with your community uh how are they first going to contribute so going beyond reading about the community or attending something but not really um talking during it um uh, how do they continue contributing after that first time um, and how will they network within the community to make connections um, with other community members and how do they begin to take on additional responsibility and leadership i think um, these are really important questions to think about because uh, they it's important to be intentional about all of these things i think these things are sometimes going to happen organically but they're going to happen much faster and much better i think in a much healthier way if you're being intentional about how people move from one step to the other and 
um, somebody mentioned earlier a uh, op open source projects in the, in the comments in the chat and how a lot of open source projects have not they struggle to, um, I guess, to increase the size of the kind of pool of key maintainers or, or kind of core developers working on a project. And what I really want to encourage you to think about, and that this mountain of engagement model encourages you to think about is how actually that process of um increasing your pool of like core key contributors starts right at the bottom of this mountain you have to be thinking about how you bring new people in and how you help those new people get more and more engaged with every step of the process to funnel people eventually into um into that kind of core group not everybody is going to become a member of that core group and that's not the point the point is to try to make sure that anyone who has the capacity and the interest to move up this mountain knows the paths to be able to do so uh how are we doing for time i think i need to hand over to you sarah so i'll, I'll just say um there's a couple of links in the document to mozilla um resources around this, the mountain of engagement and a description of contributor pathways, uh, which is, is very related to that in my experience. And then uh, the final link here is to uh, a template created by Mozilla for you to, to help you to think about the mountain of engagement as it relates to your particular community and to try to be intentional about that planning. Um, okay, um, over to Sarah for question four. Awesome. Um, that's, that's really great. So we, we've talked about the communities that you admire and um, why you admire them. And then we came closer home and um, talked about the communities that you have been actively involved in um, or are actively involved in right now and um, what first attracted you to those communities and why you've continued to stay in those communities. Uh, we also worked together to define, you know, uh, community sustainability and what that means to us. Um, and we got a set of guiding questions um, to help us think about um, community sustainability. Uh, now, what we want to do um, is thinking about the mountain of engagement that Toby has, has just shared, um, place some of the um, activities that you've observed in communities that you admire or communities that you're a part of um, and place them in those different stages that there are um, in the mountain of engagement. So uh, we want you to start thinking about how the communities you belong to or have been a part of or know about promote sustainability and to share resources like links um, to that expound on this um, on these activities that promote sustainability um, or just share your stories in writing. And um, we have sort of this different <clears throat> drawing um, for the mountain of engagement showing the more specific um, you know, stops for different levels of participation to guide you through. Um, so from the point you discover that there's this community that exists that you'd love to be a part of to when you um, first start to be involved and then how your participation grows over time um, to, to finding yourself in a position of leadership where you're able to influence the activities and the roadmaps for your community. Um, so with this in mind, and, and this will stay on for a while, um, I, I invite you to share, you know, how the communities you participate in or um, admire, how they approach the question of sustainability at these different levels. So you can write for now and we'll discuss it a bit more. Um, and I'll probably invite some people who would like to unmute themselves and talk about some of these um, communities and activities, if you like. I really appreciate the vulnerability, um, the, the, the people that shared that they don't do this yet. Um, 
and and that's that's completely okay that's why we have this session and i think in the next section we're going to be talking about some of the challenges you shared yesterday and how you know we can begin to um, look at some of the resources that have been shared here as a way to begin to alleviate those challenges and um, for people who are only beginning to think about community sustainability um, what what might be good starting points for you so that's completely okay i really like the um, staggered trustee terms so um it's it's similar to something i've seen done well at the carpentries where um, any two leadership bodies that exist um, sort of have an overlapping period uh, where they both serve so that there's a, a complete handover process, but also so that there's um, a lot of handholding at the beginning, which, which really helps with moving the work along um, and without uh, making people who are coming in feel more overwhelmed um, than, than they really need to be. So that's, that's really cool. Yeah, I actually think that um, going down to, you know, the grassroots level, so to speak, and, and thinking about how to support um, local groups that uh, constitute your global community or your regional community is, is a really important point. Um, so you, you mentor people, you create resources to support them as they um, set up local affiliates of, of your community. And as much as possible, um, as often as possible, give them the financial resourcing as well. Um, I know this is, is not always possible, but um, in situations where it is, setting up a community fund that um, specifically speaks to this is, is a really crucial um, point. So providing the resources to guide people, but also giving them the means to be able to, to do the things that they need to do. Right. Um, someone says grow gradually versus grow rapidly. And I think this was one of the questions that was raised um, in the champion session. Um, you know, the, the place of affording the people who are really excited about getting in and doing the work um, versus creating processes to make sure that people who won't necessarily, you know, jump at the opportunity, but if invited, they will come in and also do the work well. Um, I think this, this is also important to strike that balance um, and there's a place for, for each of those things. So determining what will happen and at what point um, in a way that, you know, ensures equity um, and, and affords everyone opportunity to shine as, um, as they would like to is important. Mm -hmm. Right. Cross-community collaboration is also a big one. And I love this one specifically um, because especially like in the open science and open source space, a lot of the work that we all do at some point or other overlaps. And um, instead of reinventing the wheel in the way that we are creating resources, um, coming together to co-create resources is a really great thing to do or apply for funding that speaks to you know, bigger elements of the work that need to be done, needs to be done across the board for different organizations. So finding as much opportunity as possible for cross community collaboration is really great. I also appreciate the thoughts that goes into um, designing communications um, that meet people where they are. So I will give an example of the carpentries where we have this global community situated in different countries. In some countries, um, some of the tools that we employ for communications are blocked for one reason or another, so political policies. And so we can't count on those um, platforms alone as a means of communication. The people who have enough email and don't want to receive any more email. And so, and then there are people who are on Twitter, there are people who are not. 
Um, so affording people the opportunity to hear about activities that are going on from wherever it is they, they prefer. So if I don't want to receive email, there's a newsletter that I can subscribe to that's only, you know, once every two weeks rather than every time someone sends a mail to the mailing list. Or if I'm not on Twitter, um, I can log into Slack whenever I want. Um, if I'm not on Slack and I prefer, you know, the mailing list and there's that. So that's important. Um, Jeremy's made a really good mm -hmm. point and asked an interesting question in the chat. Um, which I think relates to something that Sarah mentioned earlier, I was probably going to talk about now, now might be the time to talk about it. Um, so Jeremy in the chat says, from my fairly limited experience of trying to ensure community sustain sustainability, I feel there's a challenge when you've built the pyramid, i.e. got to the point where you have people at all of the levels. It's then mm. easy to forget that this has to be an ongoing process, that people will want to leave community leadership roles and move on. Is there an iterative element to this process? And yeah, absolutely. I think as well as being um, intentional about how you facilitate that movement between all of the stages, you, there has to be this recognition that it's um, that work is never really done. Um, and this hits two points that I wanted to make today, really. Um, the first being that, yeah, I think it's really important to have offboarding processes as well as onboarding processes and to, to make sure that your volunteers understand how they can step back if personal circumstances change or whatever and they realize that they can no longer commit the time that they thought they were going to be able to to their, to fulfill the role properly and make sure that they understand that it's okay to say to say that um so that they don't end up trying to stick with it longer than they should have done and damaging themselves and and the project i think like the community ultimately if they're not able to to do to perform that role properly um and then the other thing I wanted to mention that's implied, I think, in all of this, um, but the, I really want to drill home while we've got the opportunity is that all of this requires the kind of infrastructure to be there, the person infrastructure to be there is we, we're talking a bit about systems and resources and processes, but you need the community manager there or, or multiple community managers perhaps there to make sure that all of this is happening. Um, and if you are the only person who's responsible for this for your community and your um, your employers or whoever is kind of the, the leadership above you is not providing you with the resources and the time to be able to do this effectively, then in the end, a community, your community is not going to be sustainable because your efforts as a community manager are not sustainable. Um, I'm probably preaching to the converted by saying that to this audience, but I do think it's a really important message to uh, take home and to tell the people who make decisions strategically within your organization, if you are within such an organization, uh, to make sure that they understand the importance of that person infrastructure as well. Right. Um, I think uh, in addition to what Toby has said, and I think um, speaking to a question about some organizations being overly structured um, or feeling like they're overly structured and, and that that gets in the way of, you know, um, innovation, so to speak. Uh, one of the things I think is really important um, as you think about the question of sustainability is um, uh, first, um, listening to your community. So like someone said, having surveys or feedback systems where um, continually and periodically you're hearing from people about the experiences with the structures you've put in place, uh, what is working really well, um, what's also not working, and also knowing what you will do with the feedback when it comes in. So when people tell you something is not working, what do you do about that? So I think a big element of community sustainability is making sure um, that you are open to learning and relearning and your infrastructure and systems are also designed in that way, um, you know, that um, they're not stifled, so to speak, there's always wiggle room. Um, a good way to do this is to 
involve your community in the co-creation process. Someone said that's probably the slower method, but I would argue it's also the surer method um, because if community um, is part of the co-creation process of these initiatives, there's of course ownership, co-ownership, which keeps people there, but also it ensures that because you've started working with community to co-create, when things change and things need to be shifted, it's community that still will be involved in that process. And so you're continuing with that um, community-led process in designing your initiatives, um, which sort of allows, allows for lots of room to learn, relearn and unlearn things as you go along. Um, you have to be very flexible along the way. Um, this is really great and thank you all for sharing. Um, I think because of time we have to revisit um, yesterday's challenges. I know we could easily spend a day here because um, there's lots to talk about here, but I'd like to afford um, the time to discuss the challenges that were shared and highlighted yesterday and some of the ways we are thinking about um, you know, addressing this or suggesting. Okay. Just trying to fight off a sneeze for a moment. Uh, bad timing. Uh, yeah, so revisiting the the challenges that you all highlighted yesterday, and then looking at some resources that are available to help you tackle sustainability related challenges. You'll see in the next section of the document. Um, I've summarised again the um, uh, the areas the sort of categories that the challenges you identified fell into. Um, and those were uh, thinking about engagement and um, incentives for, for contributions, um, managing, I guess, the expectations of the, um, of the community members or potential community members, um, communication, uh, how, to, um, how to sort of choose a platform and get people to engage in communication on that platform and reaching critical mass. Um, accessibility, Sarah mentioned earlier, and I think this is really important to, um, to think about as well uh, when considering the, the ways that your, that your community will communicate. Um, and participation in general, um, how, to, how to predict how and when people will participate, um, uh, how to help potential members decide whether or not it's something that they want to participate in. And I've pasted just now a list of, um, of resources that Sarah and I have put together um, and also linking to some of the ones that, that Lou shared earlier as well, um, broken down into the, um, broadly into the kind of stages of the, um, the mountain of engagement. I, I'm mixing my metaphors a bit. I should think about like the plateaus on the mountain or something um, as you're climbing it uh, and some resources that you can refer to to support each of those different um, state like levels of engagement up as you climb that mountain. Um, I've also left some space and I really want to encourage all of you, if you are aware of any other resources or tools that you'd like to share with people that are helpful for these particular um, aspects of, of community sustain sustainability, so please also share them here. Um, full disclosure, I guess, uh, Sarah and I are planning to write a blog post um, to follow up from this session. Um, where we will probably summarize uh, uh, towards the end the, um, the list of resources that we're sharing here. So if you are sharing specific resources, please, and if you're comfortable to, please add your name next to the ones that you're sharing so that we know to credit you um, uh, when we're writing about this. Uh, and I will, don't have a lot of time, but I'm going to highlight a few that I think are, are particularly important. Um, I'm a big fan of the um, contributors guide from our open side that I know um, Lou and the CSCCE and the um, Community Engagement Fellows Program uh, was a very influential on as well. Um, that's a really great example of, of a few things that I think are important for sustainability. Um, welcoming people um, and providing a relatively quick way for them to find the information that they 
specifically need that's relevant to the kind of um, engagement that they want to make with the with the community, uh, the type of contribution they want to make, or the information that they need to get out of the uh, of the the guide, and also, and I think this is crucial, it provides estimated time commitments associated with each type of engagement um, to help people really. Um, interrogate i guess whether or not they actually have the time to do to devote to do something um fully we also give at least one example that we're aware of uh, from our own community about offboarding processes um and the the way that that our instructor trainers can um voluntarily sort of step away from their duties um leaving the door open for them to come back again um, if they want to but this is very helpful for us to um, I think a question that's come up a lot is around how we can plan uh, how we can plan activity on the kind of whole community level based largely on volunteer efforts and having this way for people to tell us when they want to step back because they don't think they will have time to to perform their duties within a particular role this is really helpful for us to get a, a more realistic idea of what our capacity is um, for a given period of time um, and there's a lot more in here as well uh, that sadly i think i don't have time to go through in in a huge amount of detail um, we're mentioning things like peer mentoring programs if anyone's got any other examples they can link to of, of peer mentoring programs in communities that would be really helpful um centering accessibility um we've shared a resource um and a checklist there as well for you to look at um uh, community funds to help incentivize and and um reward and support contributions um and i think the other section at the end if you can't decide what category something should go under then feel free feel free to stick them in there um but i'll stress again um the importance there in the other category of of a community manager or or if you're lucky more than one to um to dedicate time to coordinating and facilitating facilitating those efforts um and i think because we want to make sure that we've got time to answer any more questions that you all have. Um, I'm going to move us down to the final section. Um, feel free to write your questions into the doc, to write your questions into the chat, um, or to raise your hand in Zoom, um, and we can hear from you. Wow, those first two questions are really good. Um, how do you measure community sustainability? Uh, good question. <laughs> um, I think this is a really difficult thing to do. I think um, one of the one of the main challenges that I've encountered through the time that I've spent working in community management has been measuring things in general how do you measure the impact of a community as well um uh and i think the there's this sort of passive way to measure it which is over time to get an impression for whether things seem to be like tailing off and you can also measure specific types of engagement that people are making i think keep track of of the number of people who are communicating on the on the platforms and um uh the number of uh, whatever your your types of contribution are that that are really important within your community to try to make sure that you're counting those and keeping track of the the overall trends in those um but i think the the specific metrics that equate to engagement um will vary from community to community if you're doing things like trying to establish um leadership structures for example within your community then a good way to measure the sustainability of your community is to look at um how many people nominate themselves for election to those positions if you're if you're doing community elections and um i think as well the sort of 
geographic um, or like the diversity of those candidates in general, um, depending on the on the geography or the the demographics of your community. Um, Sarah, did you have anything you wanted to add on this? No, I, I think both you and Lou have covered it well. Uh, one of the things I also look for is for initiatives that have existed for a long time. Um, every time you put out a call for applications or people to be involved, um, are you getting you know increased number numbers of people applying, um, or it's you know the same six people that are serving in other initiatives and other areas of your community also applying to this. So if you're continually attracting uh, new voices, that's a really good way to check um, that you you're sort of moving in the right direction and right path. It's also good to check for the content of discussions or, or input and output that comes in through different initiatives. So um, if there are no new ideas for a long time, that might be a sign that, you know, something needs to change there. Um, it's probably talk to more people outside of the premise of people that are currently involved or um, consider that your initiative is saturated for all the value it can bring and what else can be done to be able to cover more bases. So things like that. Um, but the question of metrics, I agree. Um, it varies from initiative to initiative and so um, find out what makes sense to you and particularly beyond numbers, how many people are in Slack, how many people are um, answering questions. So to the bigger uh, qualitative sort of questions. Okay, and in the interest of time, I think it's better to hand back to Jeremy, I think, for the final wrap up. Um, I'm uh, to Michelle for the final wrap up, and I'm going to keep responding to questions in the uh, directly in the document. Well, um, thank you. Toby. Th thanks, yeah. everybody for participating. And thanks, Sarah, for uh, doing an awesome job of uh, co leading this with me. Yes, thank you indeed to Toby and Sarah. I'm delighted to hear that you're going to write a blog of all those great resources because that certainly came to my mind when I saw that list and said, what, thought, wow, this is too long for me to fit into a tweet. Uh, I'm sure that will be a, a, a much used resource. And uh, even the list of questions that uh, we now have at the end, I think is evidence that there's so much more uh, we could uh, continue to discuss in, in this space. And I guess Louise Brown, when source, if source starts up again sometime in the future, we'll already be able to uh, scope out uh, some of the things that we could cover in a, another iteration of, of this in the future. So I'd like to emphasize to everyone that we really hope for all of you, uh, this is just part of your journey. Uh, there's been a number of ways uh, suggested throughout these two days on how you can continue this conversation. We hope it's helped you realise that you're not alone, uh, that your challenges are shared by many and thought about by many, and that there are people in uh, the research software community, the RSE community, uh, the research community more broadly, uh, many other spheres uh, who can help, uh, help you uh, and who you can help. Uh, so please think about joining some of the uh, things that we've suggested, such as the CSCCE uh, community, uh, including their Slack or the Society of RSE uh, Communities channel, Slack, uh, and I'm sure uh, there's others that you may want to share amongst yourselves and avail yourself of all these fantastic written resources, such as the ones that Toby and Sarah have just, uh, just given us. So I think that draws us to a close. Uh, the recording will be available on the source website in, in due course. Uh, and we do hope some of these conversations continue in, in other forums and that you've found other people you want to continue engaging with. So my last uh, job is to thank everyone. Uh, thank you again to our fabulous speakers, uh, Sarah and Tony, uh, Toby and Lou and the lightning talks yesterday. Uh, thanks to my co-organizers, Jeremy Cohen and Daniel Neust. And, and thank you, of course, to all of you. Uh, I think it's a testimony to how uh, fantastic this workshop's been that so many of you have come for the two days and stayed and really actively in, engaged. And uh, we've had a lot of informal 
uh, feedback uh, uh, to the organisers as well, saying that people wish they brought their whole teams and can we run it again on an American time zone. Uh, but it wouldn't have been that success without all of you here engaging uh, and being open to sharing your challenges and your, your successes. Uh, so fantastic.